Um, welcome, everybody, to the Martin E. Siegel Theater Center here at the Greuther Center CUNY. My name is Frank Henschkan. I'm the director, executive director, and the director of programs together with uh, Alison Lyman, who's my new co directors over here, and Rebecca Shane, my managing director. So we have a, a, an important uh, lecture today here, um, not only by the person who will give it, but also in the memory of our wonderful, great colleague. Um, Daniel uh, Gerald, who passed uh, last year. He was a friend, a mentor, an unrivaled teacher, and was one of the great, great, great professors of the CUNY system, like also Marvin Carlson, who is here with us. And I also would like to acknowledge Edviga Gerald, um, who also came here again. The Edviga, thank you for being with us, continuing to work with us for the archives, and also letting us name this lecture you know, after uh, Daniel. And I know if Daniel would be here, he would be very thrilled uh, and, uh, and honored uh, to have Mel Gordon, his good friend, um, as uh, the speaker of the inaugural um, Daniel Gerald Memorial Lecture. And Mel will speak on Shakespeare on the experimental Russian stage. And everybody who knows about Mel knows how many tricks and things and archival things nobody has ever seen he has in his suitcase. And with him, we did evenings on German expressionistic dance on the group theater on um, uh, many, many other things on uh, Meyer Hall's biomechanic. And uh, so I know that you're into something very, very special. I know how hard it is to take our time here in New York City. It's uh, Wednesday and it's 5 o'clock. We thought it was also a good time for a lecture. So thank you for coming and, and uh, being here with us. And um, before I introduce Mel, if you have a cell phone, just take it out for one moment and put it on silent, on mute. I'll do the same so it's not... On. And um, after the lecture, which will be about 40, 45 minutes, and some questions. Tonight we have also Academia Rojo, a significant theater company, one of the most important uh, of Poland, who's here um, at uh, 7 o'clock as part of the Performa Festival. They will perform. You see the sandbox they're going to then put together. So in case you really have no home and nothing to do, uh, you would love to have you uh, back. But now uh, here is Emil uh, Gordon um, from informally NYU, now at San Francisco University. And he flew in for this lecture. Again, Mel, thank you so much. Yeah, it's, it's a great honor uh, to be uh, one of the first or the first speaker for the um, Daniel Gerald um, uh, Memorial Lecture. Uh, and I was thinking about uh, my relationship with Dan, which was so close and had gone on for so long that I was actually never a formal student of Dan Gerald some of you, uh, uh, I think, are, that um, oddly enough, how I learned about Dan uh, was related to this lecture. It didn't even occur to me that uh, I was a, uh, a renegade student uh, in Berkeley when um, making radical theater, when someone gave me a handful of educational theater journals. And I looked through them, shaking my head. Why would I, what was in it for me, and, and how could this help with um, my making of theater? And one of the articles was by Dan, and it was about Mikhail, someone I'll talk about today. It was his analysis of this 1935 Soviet King Lear production. And everything in the article startled me. One, it was written with great insight and humor an understanding, which almost none of the other uh, academics had, of how historical research can inspire and inform um, experimental theater right then. So I was just excited about it. Uh, tried to find Dan at San Francisco State, but he uh, was then at CUNY. So the very first thing I did when I came to New York in the 70s, was to sit in on a lecture by Dan, and uh, which was also uh, fantastic on yet another topic, and I introduced myself. So he became my mentor uh, in ways that I hadn't uh, ever imagined of uh, being interested in practical theater uh, by looking at history in, in the most practical terms. So that, that's what I want to do here in, in, in the short hour that we have. Um, uh, this is to look at some Soviet productions, including the one that Dan had um, 
described on the coils. We'll actually see a film clip of it. Uh, of course, we'll, in almost all cultures, that Shakespeare becomes part of the practice. Uh, and there's, uh, in Russia, as everywhere else, there was a great divide between intellectuals, people like um, Lev Tolstoy and, and even uh, Pushkin, in understanding um, what Shakespeare was doing and the practice of it. People like Stanislavski used Shakespeare in the 1890s, of course, as ways of doing spectacular uh, and impressive displays of new forms of acting, but also uh, with um, elaborate scenic designs and magical tricks with lighting and, and, and sound effects. Uh, after the revolution, there had to be a new way of thinking about how to use the Shakespeare. And the very first um, group that did it was um, uh, Alexandrov, um, Alexander uh, Tayerov's Carmony Theater did Romeo and Juliet in 1921. I'll try to move fast through it because there are five productions and they're quite gorgeous. Uh, Tayerov's production wasn't successful according to academics. In other words, uh, critics typically didn't like what he was doing and, and, and fellow practitioners, but the audiences were crazy for it. I met lots of people in Moscow who only went to Tayarov productions, which is kind of typical because they were filled with glamour and a kind of Americanism uh, that didn't appear anywhere else on the Soviet stages. And here with Romeo and Juliet, which was typically an interesting Soviet production, there were hundreds of these, uh, that the audiences interpreted everything in their Russian style of what was not being said. So Romeo trying desperately to climb up the ladder uh, to the balcony of Juliet and not making it uh, would touch the audiences in a completely different way. And, and that's what happened here. Uh, the designer, uh, Exter, uh, was famous in this production of creating seven different staging areas. Uh, and here we have this vivacious idea of Romeo and Juliet, not so much as a tragedy, but is this failed attempt uh, to escape, to overcome all obstacles um, in, in their environment of love. And here we see uh, Verona uh, with, and everything is these um, uh, superimposed uh, acting atmospheres that we see here uh, in capes. Uh, lots of music. Here's the main square in Verona, just filled to capacity. And then the Capulets and the Montagues fight. And even in the fighting, everything is aestheticized. That Tayerov had, again, a kind of acting system that the other avant-gardists in, in Soviet Russia didn't like, but the audiences adored. And this is one that, uh, where he used models, basically, both grotesque, as we'll see, and uh, 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 fabulous looking characters, including his wife, uh, Elisa Kunin. And here we have the prince stops the brawl. Uh, we have Romeo as a kind of um, fey character uh, without any, the way Shakespeare um, uh, is usually interpreted is not having much on his mind and not being terribly heroic and, and being a kind of um, spoiled brat uh, up until the mask ball. And the mask ball, of course, as you can imagine, uh, was filled with different sorts of dancing. According to Tayerov, the real problem of Romeo and Juliet is they both have favorite uh, uh, different songs in their heart. So they can never really come together because uh, there's something musically different between them. And here, uh, the famous scene, what lady is that? And suddenly, we have Romeo begins to represent this new Soviet revolutionary uh, type who's going to overcome all obstacles uh, to, to attain uh, happiness. And here we have the orchard. And this balcony scene that the audiences went crazy for where uh, we have uh, Romeo just about making it to the balcony and falling and trying again and again. 
uh, the, the, the fight scenes were, were um, as you can see here, uh, quite spectacular and uh, filled with this kind of um, uh, carmony aestheticism of uh, with the movement is always um, mostly dance. Uh, and then yet again, uh, the prince stops the fight. Here we have Juliet's bedroom and everything's in movement here. Something we'd associate with Mayor Holt is actually taking uh, uh, place uh, on the Carmony Theater as well, which is sliding sets and, and um, uh, very advanced and, uh, colored lighting techniques. And uh, we have the nurse who is um, sometimes comical, but not at all here. We have Conan uh, Tyrov's wife, who was the kind of Elizabeth Taylor of her time, uh, and we'll see her yet again uh, playing Juliet. Here we have the churchyard tomb, the miscommunication from a good side picture, and the fact that there's so many photographs and drawings. It, there's so much iconography from this production, although it was short-lived, it only stayed in the repertoire for a year, is a sign of the intense interest in the Soviet audience. and the corpse of uh, Romeo. And then uh, this conclusion uh, where the prince talks about the meaning of uh, the fight between the Montagues and Capulets. The next important production, we're actually gonna see a film clip, and actually, can we bring down the lights because uh, this is such an old clip on the screen. There we go. Uh, Michael Chekhov uh, was given his own studio. Chekhov, of course, was a, uh, a, uh, the, one of the most famous actors in the Moscow Art Theater, but had a different technique that we're about to see in, in rehearsal. Uh, Chekhov wanted to marry Stanislavski's inner uh, emotional technique with Rudolf Steiner's anthroposophy, with eurythmy, with movements of the, the sort of universal movements of the body uh, to, uh, to bring them together uh, with this internal feeling in, that he used through imagination. And for his very first production in 1924, uh, Chekhov, and we'll see a, this silent clip, uh, decided to do Hamlet. And he thought that Hamlet was the story of the Russian intellectual in Soviet Russia, of trying to find a heroic way, and heroic is always the key word in these productions. Uh, Chekhov himself plays Hamlet, and uh, one of the things he was concerned with, and this is also typical of what the Russians had, is that in translation, uh, in Russian and later in Yiddish, they could change and simplify uh, the sound of Shakespeare. So it had an immediate connection to the audience as it didn't sound necessarily Elizabethan. And here's the rehearsal uh, comparing pure St Stanislavski internal technique with Chekhov's. There's Chekhov. Second Moscow Art Theater. And this theater would only last three and a half years before it would be shut down, partly because of these religious or, or quasi religious techniques we're about to see in rehearsal.
actress is being harangued to find parallels in her emotional life with those of the character. dead for three years. So this was to salute to this other kind of avant-garde. And here's a quick overview of that Hamlet that um, uh, here as you see that uh, the ghost of Hamlet appears um, to Horatio. And, um, and we have the character of Claudius where with Chekhov we have this great fight between light, uh, represented by Hamlet, and Claudius of darkness. And we have in all of these publicity stills, not all of them are publicity stills, they seem to come from different sources and lots of drawings, of this emotional turmoil that uh, Chekhov is feeling. Uh, and the uh, uh, Polonius and Laertes seen as it's copied from the Gordon Craig Stanislavski Hamlet from uh, a decade before uh, that Polonius because there's a line in Shakespeare that talks about frogs he moves like a frog and here uh, calling out uh, to his father and lots of postcards were sold a lot of these images come from postcards that people wanted to buy merchandise, uh, seeing in uh, the work of the second uh, uh, Machat. And uh, here we have uh, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern uh, with great costuming effects in why they come to uh, Elsinore. And again, a lot is captured. And Chekhov said every night he played it differently, depending on who his audience was. And uh, the quarrel with Ophelia as uh, being this bait that uh, he had to rid himself of. And uh, here um, asking Polonius, uh, what is it like to be an actor? And then we have the mousetrap scene that looks like a mousetrap, uh, ready to snap on, on, on uh, Claudius. And Vera Silivyova, who played uh, Gertrude, uh, lived across the river in New Jersey and, and talked about this to many people, of um, the feeling uh, that the, the production was about her, this fight 
of who to listen to, which, which of the men, that her new husband or her son. And here we have Polonius uh, stabbed by Hamlet and again looking very froggish in, in, in that image. Uh, in Act 3, uh, Ophelia's uh, madness is blamed on Hamlet. And here we have the Gravediggers, which was uh, an extended sequence uh, that the Soviet audiences, for some reason, loved this kind of humor. Uh, here we have Hamlet studying York's skull. And this seems to be, I've never found it, but I've looked for it. This seems to be from a film clip, uh, these images here, uh, that certainly exist somewhere in some archive in Moscow. Uh, and then the realization that the person they're bearing is Ophelia. And Ham, uh, Chekhov has a different ending in his mind of how Hamlet ought to be. That Hamlet, instead of being tragic, and we always have this conflict in the Soviet theater about what a tragedy is and how to think about it, I hear that uh, Hamlet, uh, Chekhov's Hamlet, uh, just by touching Laertes is giving him light and giving him a notion of the future. So it's a kind of happy feeling here. And then uh, even though Hamlet, uh, of course, uh, uh, murders Claudius and everyone has to die at the end, uh, that it's, it's a glorious moment because it ushers in this new revolutionary world of Fort and Boss. This is something that Dan Gerald uh, uh, often wrote about and thought about with both Polish and Russian theater, the ending of Hamlet, of um, its revolutionary and social significance. Uh, in 1932 comes the most controversial of all Hamlets. It's um, directed by uh, Nikolai Akimov, uh, the designer, and um, everything is turned upside down. This is to be uh, according to Akimov, the most ironic and the most realistic of Hamlets, where there's nothing supernatural inside it, and it becomes a real problem, one of the greatest um, early problems for uh, the Stalinist doctrine of how to approach classical theater that um, uh, has to be uh, handled with some delicacy. And here it's done uh, not at all like that, that the scenes are uh, jumbled, that uh, the characters are changed, and, and as we'll see here. Uh, so this, there is no, that I could find any filmic work of it because it was taken uh, off the stage rather quickly d d despite a, a glorious beginning. Uh, for one thing, we have here, uh, Horatio is pretending to be the ghost set up by Hamlet. So there is no, uh, 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 ghost uh, for Hamlet, and all of it is uh, set up here. Uh, in, in the second scene, we have the grave diggers already, and they present a York skull to Hamlet in the, in his library. So, um, and of course, you see the the, the uh, corpse on top in the Act Two. We have the royal hunt. Uh, is extenuated and added to this where uh, Hamlet and Horatio uh, are very wise and um, uh, outdoorsmen. Uh, and suddenly they run into Ophelia and she's got to get uh, uh, to a nunnery. And of course, Ophelia in this presentation is an alcoholic, which is her problem. Uh, Hamlet and the wine cellar where he begins to drink and that inspires his question of what is he gonna do? And uh, so nothing is taken seriously in, in the way that we normally take Hamlet. Everything is filled with twists and turns and uh, uh, ironic asides. Uh, and as you can see, and this is a famous picture that uh, was uh, issued to all of the uh, theater agencies. Uh, the, the king runs from the, uh, the players, give me some light and uh, even the king, uh, uh, Claudius, doesn't seem quite real. Uh, here we have Hamlet in Gertrude's uh, chamber where he uh, kills Polonius. 
And we have Hamlet as really a good swordsman, an outdoorsman, a hunter, uh, who's just trying to right the wrongs. Uh, and he kills uh, Polonius because what he's killing is the old world, that he's bringing revolution uh, into on the stage. And um, uh, here we, we have, and it's a kind of nightmarish scene with uh, uh, lighting effects and oversized costuming. Uh, we have um, the queen telling Claudius uh, about the murder. Uh, and then before it's over, we have um, Hamlet meets Fortinbras' uh, army that, uh, that this is the new kind of red army that's about to come, and he's going to usher them in. Uh, we have this, as we see in a drawing, and but also in a photograph, we have this uh, on-the-shoulder sort of comic fight uh, that you'd probably see in, in a beach or in a field between uh, Claudius and Hamlet, uh, trying to pull each other off uh, the throne. We have the royal banquet uh, with lots of dancing and music. And it's here that Ophelia gets so drunk that she d drowns during the royal banquet. Uh, and at the end, Hamlet and Aertes uh, duel, uh, and of course they both die. Uh, but the dueling is extenuated. And uh, we get this completely different comic idea. Here, Fortinbras breaks through and orders the bodies to be removed. So we actually have, uh, yet again, this hunt is, comes to a conclusion. Uh, and it was taken off the books, but thought about uh, and debated uh, uh, for quite some time. In, in, the, uh, in 1934, uh, Tyrov went back to Shakespeare. He, he had become famous for being uh, the leading director of O'Neill anywhere in the world, of doing kind of American-like or even Ziegfeld-type uh, spectaculars of in the international uh, repertoire. Uh, but in 1934, he combines George Bernard Shaw, Pushkin, and Shakespeare, who all wrote about Cleopatra, in a three-part uh, production called Egyptian Nights. And uh, here it starts off, um, as you see, outside the Senate with uh, 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 Antony and, uh, and, and Caesar. Uh, and it has these fabulous set pieces that have become emblematic of, of, of this particular production. The um, uh, so this, of course, is the Pushkin part. And here's our Senate. Uh, and we have this um, uh, fighting between uh, Shakespeare and this, uh, uh, between Caesar and the Senate of uh, uh, who's going to rule and who's going to uh, save the Republic uh, by going to Egypt. And uh, of course, what we have with Tyrov, the same thing that we have with Romeo and Juliet and even the, some of the same performers. We have models working um, uh, very elegantly, some very grotesque looking, uh, some uh, very beautiful. And we'll even see a film clip that an American took and I bought from him who, who uh, uh, um, uh, filmed portions of the rehearsal in 1934. So in act two, we have Cleopatra waiting by the sinks, the George Bernard Shaw part that we're familiar with. And uh, it's, uh, Cleopatra is played by Kunin, Tyrov's wife yet again. And come to the desert outpost with his great costuming and great set pieces. Uh, she welcomes uh, Antony, bids farewell. And here we have, from Shakespeare, uh, Cleopatra's palace, from Antony and Cleopatra, uh, where she welcomes him at her palace. The dying Antony is brought to her. She kisses him. And then rather than surrender to the Romans, to 
to Caesar that she uh, suicides. And here it's done in uh, the most uh, uh, Tyerov-like way. It's done beat by beat in this kind of dance-like pose. And we'll actually see it for the first time by, as I said, an American who went backstage uh, to shoot this. And here it is. These are a couple different scenes. And again, can we uh, bring the lights down? And Kunin uh, deliberately chose unattractive women to play the servants, I'm told. That she was getting long in the tooth, this uh, glamorous uh, stage performer. Here she is. And this production stayed in the repertoire for some time. Uh, they issued 78 discs and uh, lots of postcards of this. Here goes Caesar. And Tyrov, this even looks like Sydney Green Street, Tyrov had uh, this American notion of how to entertain that uh, was quite successful. And it was, um, as I said, an avant-garde that uh, the critics didn't much care for, but the audiences um, were pretty much one of the few avant-garde practitioners that had a steady audience through the 30s. And here we'll see this several times, the suicide with the ass. I want to look at just one more, but this is actually the most exciting uh, for um, most scholars, and who also have a film club of it with sound. Uh, this is the um, Gosset. Gosset was this Russian acronym um, for the State Yiddish Theater uh, in Moscow. There are 12 of these Yiddish theaters across Soviet Russia. But the one in Moscow was by far uh, the most experimental and uh, the most influential. 
And uh, it had gone through a, a, a great challenge that it was very successful in the 20s uh, doing its own communist versions of, um, of Yiddish folk tales and uh, Yiddish theater productions that were updated uh, and uh, changed in, 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 uh, uh, for the Soviet reality. It had lots of music. Uh, had lots of uh, grotesque dance, and it was one of the most sought after uh, uh, theaters for foreigners uh, in Russia. But in 1928, after it went abroad in a very successful uh, European tour, that everything changed. That the, uh, the founder, Alexei Granovsky, and, and the great director had defected. And Mikhoyles, who we'll see here, is Lear, had to take over. He was not a very talented director at first. And also, in 1929, everything had changed. That the Gosset was required to do Soviet realistic productions. Uh, it had lots of difficulty in mounting these because Yiddish was becoming uh, a, a uh, an unpopular language. At first, it was very popular, and even uh, the vast majority of audiences didn't know Yiddish, and it didn't much matter because of the topics. So between 1929 and 1935 was um, uh, a troublesome time for this cassette. It was losing audiences. It was, its propaganda, uh, pro-Soviet propaganda, was not very convincing, and it was moving in different directions. They decided uh, in the 30s to do King Lear. And uh, various directors uh, became attached to the project. Most of them didn't know Yiddish and um, struggled with uh, Mikhoyles. One was Sergei Rodloff. Uh, and Rodloff wanted to reset it in Palestine to make it authentic. But Mikhoyles would star in it and later co-direct it was against that. Mikhoyles tried to make Lear in an intelligible Yiddish uh, production set in some other world. Uh, and it wasn't a very popular decision. But uh, Mikhoyles had lots of great ideas. And working with Rodlaw, finally, uh, they began to put them together. Uh, here's the rehearsal that one of the things that Mikhoyles was able to do was to re conceived this entire Lear uh, in a communist way. One is that Mikhoyles is a kind of socialist who's doing an experiment of giving away all his possessions to show that possessions don't matter. And, um, uh, but he's learning the truth of dialectic materialism, that possessions do matter in a capitalist or feudal world. And so Cordelia, the communist, who's been trying to tell him this, uh, he gets younger and younger in every scene. He starts off as an old man. But as he's learning the communist truth, uh, th his experiment, uh, that he, everything is changing. So that's one idea that was quite radical. Mikhoyles and Radloff set it up as a chessboard, as we're about to see, uh, that everything was part of this game. And finally, what Mikhoyles did uh, that we'll actually see is that he began to stud the production with, uh, as we're seeing here in the rehearsal, with various gestures and movements and sounds that um, uh, are totally different. For one thing, uh, in Russian theater, there had been no Lear who didn't seem to be um, uh, uh, tall and regal and bearded and, and actually quite glamorous, you know, falling into insanity, where Mikhoyles didn't play it that way. He was sort of an old, old person uh, that begins to become heroic as he's learning uh, how the world really works. And the gestures, uh, which are very interesting, one is to feel if there's a crown or kippah, the skull cap on his head after he gives it away. Uh, another is to tear at his face, that as he's learning, uh, to touch himself, uh, to, and to bark. There's a lot of dog imagery in Lear, and he manages to use it with laughter uh, to make this uh, an authentic 
Yiddish or Jewish lyre. And the best story is that uh, Gordon Craig, the great um, uh, theater scholar, designer, and, and director, uh, was uh, invited to see the production in 1935 and was dreading this. So he asked to, to be put in the very last seat in the theater so he could walk out after five minutes and no one would know. And instead, of course, what happened is Craig thought it was one of the greatest Shakespeare's of the 20th century and came night after night. So uh, maybe we can bring down the lights. The imagery, and again, there's so much paintings and drawings and photographs of this production uh, that are just uh, fabulous. This is just a tiny sample of it. Uh, and this becomes the most seen Yiddish theater event in history. 800,000 people see this uh, production over the years. 80% uh, don't know a word of Yiddish, that they uh, either get a synopsis or, of course, no Lear. And it becomes this glorious moment of um, the establishment of Yiddish theater in the Silver Age. So here we have a Lear entering like the old man. Uh, he goes, and we'll see a clip of this. Uh, he, the fool uh, jumps onto the throne, and Lear uh, grabs him by the ear and pulls him away. He starts to count, because this is another one of the gestures, like this. Uh, and this is the way he controls his world. The world is that he's not a king. He's a wise man. And so he doesn't even need possessions uh, to establish himself. And this is what he'll learn is his mistake. Uh, and so Mikhoyles establishes something brand new, that this is going to be the revolution which will be the destruction of old ideas of socialism, of idealism, into the hardcore reality of Bolshevikism, that possessions mean everything in this world. And of course, it becomes the symbol of how Shakespeare is seen across the Soviet ethos, that it's a time of feudalism moving into the Renaissance, moving into another era. So here we have Goneril and uh, Reagan praising Lear. Lear doesn't really care. Uh, Cordelia, of course, demures, doesn't want to praise him, and he thinks that's part of the game. And there's so this hunting imagery in this as well, where he offers the crown. And um, so in, in the language uh, of Shakespeare is greatly simplified in this Yiddish version that actually makes it sound like it was written in Yiddish. You know, uh, Gornish kommt Gornish. Uh, and here we have Lear leaving the throne room, and here we have this chessboard set opening up. Um, and being angry, of course, with Kent uh, and uh, interested in how the kings of Burgundy and France are going to, uh, which will accept Cordelia. And then he decides the experiment is now beginning. He's going to show his wisdom is greater than uh, his need for possessions. Uh, and we have this great moment that we'll take a look at between Benjamin Zuskin uh, playing the fool who will sing Yiddish songs, even a song about Shakespeare that, that we'll hear, of, um, uh, between him and his relationship with Lear. I pray thee, Mary, thy wit shall never go slipshod. And we have this strange leer laughter and barking sound. And here, everything in his experiment begins to fall apart. Uh, that um, uh, Goneril and then, uh, and, and, and of course Reagan, uh, are defying him in the, the number of, uh, of, uh, uh, of assistants he can have. He doesn't understand why uh, his demands are being rejected. And for the first time, and here's even an image uh, that someone took uh, in the middle of the production of uh, that he's lost the game. And for the first time in this act two, that Lear realizes that he's misunderstood who he is in feudalism. And so act three is finding out that he's, you know, he's like poor Tom, that uh, they're both uh, unmoored 
and, and uh, on the heath here. And there's so much iconography of this particular scene uh, on the heath that here I stand your slave, that uh, this becomes this high moment in the Yiddish theater. Um, let me talk, first let me talk to this philosopher. And uh, we have Gloucester and Cornwall uh, uh, in this sort of Grand Guignot like fight. And uh, of course Gloucester is blinded and, and, uh, but now he can see. And uh, everything becomes the opposite of course in this kind of theater the absurdish world. But here it seems to make more sense because the way uh, Mikhoyles has set up who uh, Lear is, he's not um, uh, 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 a deranged you know, idiot. Uh, he's not a, a mad king. He's someone who's trying an experiment that backfires. Uh, what art thou mad then kill, 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 kill? And here uh, he meets up with Cordelia now that he knows the dialectic truth of life and he does something that he's done in the beginning he rubs stomachs with her and does a dance with her. I think this lady to be my child, Cordelia. So I am. And here they rub stomachs. Will it please your highness walk? And uh, because now he's happy, even though they're both captured, they're both prisoners, that he's finally understood what Cordelia is trying to tell him about the world. And again, rubbing the stomachs. Uh, pray you now, forget and forgive. I am old and foolish. And of course, he's actually younger. And then in five, she's dead. And he thinks it's a game that so, and we'll see this moment where he calls out uh, this hunting sound uh, to see, and he does something which uh, he, instead of kissing her, he kisses her like a mezuzah. He puts his fingers on her lips and kisses his fingers. And here, look on her, look, her lips, look there, look there. So let's bring down the lights and and it shows him without the beard, this grotesque, tiny little man playing the greatest of all Shakespeare's uh, characters there in a kind of shock uh, for the, uh, the Soviet audiences who uh, care about these things. long uh, beginning before any words are spoken where Lear comes shuffling in like an old woman. Cordelia's behind him. It's a game that they always play. So, yeah. He's counting, can't find her. It's been a late, it's been a night, nor way, they did show in their part, but far ugly, but they there was. Saying, I am a fool, I am a jester. He's talking about his line of Shakespeare. Der 
and here Uber is doing, he's going to uh, cut his crown in half and give half to Reagan and half to Donald so it falls off their heads. I'm Kenick. And this, of course, is loyal. Uh, and here, finally, in, in, in Act 5, he can't believe that Cordelia is dead. So, uh, this is where I stopped. Of course, there's hundreds of these uh, Soviet productions. But this is really the, um, the end of this um, great time, certainly by 1936, uh, um, that the experimental uh, or the high experimental uh, world of the Soviet uh, theater had collapsed. And Tyrov's theater was uh, taken away from him uh, the Gossette would be under, um, as all the other theaters, under he very heavy censorship. And so, uh, though Shakespeare continues, it's not really to the 50s that it seems to uh, capture an international audience. Again, uh, we have to, there's another group coming in. So I want to um, uh, take a, a few minutes if you have any questions about these productions. Yeah. First question, you said the fight scenes were mostly dance. Could you elaborate on that? The fight scenes were mostly what? Dance. W fight scenes for which one? Um, you said that about Romeo and Juliet. The fight scenes were, they, they were highly choreographed. Uh, okay. I, um, uh, in a way, much more than um, we would think of a theater production, uh, in, in a way that uh, Tyrov had ballet masters uh, and, and choreographers uh, work with the actors. So um, they were uh, so highly choreographed that no one in theater had quite seen it. So when uh, swords would... Um, uh, would hit each other on the top of the stage exactly the same moment w would happen uh, towards the, the uh, downstage right and so forth. Everything was um, uh, thought of as a dance piece, but also the, the, um, the speaking as well was, uh, 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 was very musical and uh, as a matter of fact, they wanted to bring this particular production to New York because they thought that of all the Soviet productions taking place in the early 20s, this is the one that was likely to 
enthused an American audience the most because it was um, uh, so highly aesthetic with its color and its fight scenes uh, and even the musicality of the language. Second question, was it common to film theater plays? Yeah, Those this were is a great so question. well filmed, I was amazed by the camera no, work. It, everyone's a different story. That uh, The last thing we saw is an interesting episode that just like in the US, that the theater began to disappear in the 30s uh, because in its fight with sound movies uh, in the culture, the same thing was happening in Russia that was happening in America. Uh, so the Russians had a solution. Before every feature movie, there had to be a, a sound clip of theater. And that's how, <coughs> that's how the theater got captured. That, uh, in other words, to encourage people who were no longer really thinking much about the theater to remind them that in Moscow and elsewhere, there were these great productions, that that would be part of the, the trailers to see theater pieces. So we have a lot of theaters captured exactly like this. Each one of these is a little different. Uh, the silent piece you saw with Egyptian Nights, as I told you, that I found an American who'd gone to Russia and filmed everything. Uh, he didn't know any Russian, and he had very noisy cameras. So he would wait to the most uh, noisy avant-garde moments of all these productions, when people are shouting or the music was loud, and he'd start filming. Uh, but this piece that we saw, uh, Kunin wanted to come to America, so he got invited to film the rehearsals. So that's how that, that uh, is captured. Anything else? Yeah. I have two questions, too. Um, one, who was this American? How did you track him down? Did he bring his films home with him? He filmed everything. The, the, this American... Uh, had the fastest indoor film footage in the world in the 20s and 30s. So he went around the world filming avant-garde theater. And uh, how I tracked him down, that he showed this at Carnegie Hall in the 30s. And I read about him, and I figured I have to find this person long before the internet. And I found him on day one by chance. He was in the same bookstore where I asked about him. No. <laughs> in a bookstore about the size uh, in, near Union Square, a communist bookstore. I said, have you ever, I said to the, the bookstore owner, have you ever heard of this guy? He said he's in the back room. <laughs> so that's how I got it. And then when I looked at the materials, and I have a lot of it, I was astonished. She was on 35 nitrate. And um, I said, what do I do now? He said, how much money do you have in the bank, young man? I said, $200. He says, that's what this will cost. So I wrote him a check for $200, so that's how I got it. And uh, yeah, and it was a, a lot. Of, this is just a tiny little clip, a few minutes. But you know, I bought hours of, of stuff all over the world. He was shooting it. What year? In uh, right, what? It was from the years um, oh, 1922 to about 1938. He, had, he just he kept had, getting, he going had, back? He had garage fulls of this stuff. And I had to sit there and look at it in 35 nitrate. So when it was falling, it was literally deteriorating. So have you been able to preserve it? Oh, of and course I did, yeah. Wow. Yeah. And it's all different kinds of stuff. That This is just the one Shakespearean thing that I found uh, for us to look at. But I think I showed it in the past, a few um, other pieces here, because um, my intention is also for people to see it and to use it and all of that. But there's a lot of stuff in archives, not just there. Uh, I'll just mention in a minute that Almost all archives in America and Europe have something called a morgue. A morgue is stuff they have no idea what it is. It's just piles of reels. A lot of it is theater, which they have no interest in, because they're interested in films. So there's theater clips captured, and I was in Vienna and bought a ton of stuff that, no, that of, of uh, German uh, and uh, Austro-Hungarian uh, dance and theater that was thought to be totally lost, that uh, was just there. And I said, how much? And you know, of course, it wasn't $200. But uh, a lot of it is just endangered, and it's just sealed in these tins. And almost every archive in North American Europe has a morgue where they just don't, it's not labeled, so they don't know what it is. And you just have to look at it. Is, do you have a lot of dance stuff? Oh, yeah. And the, uh, uh, we must talk. 
But the other question is, um, I believe that composers wrote music for all these productions. The what? There, that each production had music written for, for it. You, and you won't believe who the, I know we have to leave soon because it, there's another group coming in, but for that, and I should have done something with it, I hadn't thought of it, for Egyptian Nights, the composer was Prokofiev. Uh, and for some other uh, productions that I have, silent footage, the composer is Shostakovich. That, that, uh, and of course to match, and not only that, like the Egyptian Nights, the actors recorded in radio studios the very monologues that we saw. I just haven't had the technologies, and, and, and uh, any kid could probably do you know, what would take me forever to do, is to put the original music uh, with the dialogue. But I have a lot of the silent footage. Almost all of it is, is, is silent. But uh, the Soviet radio also broadcast a lot of these uh, theater productions, so it could be um, somewhat matched up. I think we, yeah. Yeah. Uh, hi. I um, you kept mentioning um, the influence of Americans on these productions, and I wondered w how you got to Americans because there was work in Italy, and uh, I, and are you talking about films? The the. Uh, no, no. I was talking about um, Tyrov in, in particular that Tyrov was the most international, the, the one we saw of the Romeo and Juliet and, and Egyptian night. But one of the things he's famous for is doing, uh, directing uh, a number of American productions that weren't even directed here. No one could, would bother, like O'Neill. O'Neill's best productions were directed by him, which I have film clips of, and uh, Machina. Uh, was first directed by him, and a lot of um, female American playwrights were first directed by him, never in America. So he had the most international reputation. He was compared to Ziegfeld, uh, but he was also interested. He uh, was the first person outside Germany to direct Three Penny Opera. Uh, he had this international reputation, uh, being the most cosmopolitan, so he was one of the few Soviet directors. Differently than Mayor Hull, uh, who we would think would be um, uh, drawn here, he was the one that commercial Broadway had the most interest in bringing because he had a kind of Broadway understanding of audiences. Oddly enough, uh, it was the, the, the critics and the theater historians who dislike him the most, partly because of his broad and flexible American attitude towards audiences to entertain them. Thank you so much. Thank you. thank you for coming, and I think this was a truly brilliant lecture, and I'm sure you're one of the few people of the entire world who have seen these clips, and we want to thank Mel Gordon for his treasure chest, which he opens <laughs> once in a while for us. And um, also for you to know, if you're interested in the work of Daniel Gerald, we created a great website, the Daniel Gerald Archive, where uh, all his courses, his syllabi, his letters, uh, his plays, and uh, also lectures are on there. Yet Viga is working on it. So um, it is also quite a, a universe of its own. So please do check it out. Again, thank you for coming. And we have to ask you to go a little bit faster than normally, because behind these doors is a group from uh, Poland, Academia Ruchu. I can't wait to connect these uh, 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 pieces of wood to a sandbox. And they're here in 50 minutes, the performance is going to start. So thank you. <laughs>